morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's NCC Psychiatry Grand Rounds. I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Ellen Sachs, who is a distinguished professor of law, psychology, and psychiatry, uh, and behavioral sciences at the University of Southern California. She wrote a very popular memoir, The Center Cannot Hold, her journey through madness, uh, where she describes her struggles with schizophrenia and managing the craft of holding herself together, uh, has won numerous honors. She also writes on law and mental health, and just published five books and over 50 articles and book chapters. So very well established in the field. And uh, we thank you for presenting today. I'll turn this over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm honored uh, and delighted to deliver grand rounds to you today. I would like to thank the US Army Medical Command the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, and Walter Reed Hospital for thinking that what I have to say is worthy of your time. I'm especially mindful that my talk comes less than one week after Veterans Day. Please let me humbly and respectfully thank both the veterans and the active, du active duty members here today for your service. We live in a pluralistic society where citizens are allowed, even encouraged, to voice opinions. But amidst the uh, um, occasional cacophony, please never forget the millions of us who are deeply grateful for the sacrifices you have made and continue to make for our country and who are always mindful that we live in a democracy that you are ready to defend for us. So thank you. I have lived with schizophrenia for the past 45 years. I've spent hundreds of days in psychiatric hospitals. I was given a quote, grave prognosis and was told that I would live in a board and care where I well enough to stay out of the hospital. Had I been born even 20 years earlier, that's almost certainly where I would be today. But things have turned out differently for me. Good psychiatric treatment has kept me alive. Sensitive and wise psychiatric treatment has allowed me to flourish. People who struggle with mental health disorders are not just walking symptoms that can be cured by a pill. Mental health and mental illness involve whole people who live in relational, social, and political contexts. We must understand people in the richness and the fullness of their lives. The title of my talk today is Making Peace with My Mental Illness, A Lifelong Project. Schizophrenia is a relational illness. By relational, I mean that it involves personal identity, that it profoundly implicates one's social world, and that it has political meanings as well. I will be talking about the relational aspects of schizophrenia using excerpts from my memoir, The Center Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness, as a window into these issues. I have left time at the end for a discussion and I'm eager to hear your thoughts on my reflections. The seeds of my illness appeared when I was in high school. It was an isolated incident that came apparently out of nowhere and quickly passed. In retrospect, it was my illness announcing itself to me, reading from uh, the text. It was around this time that I read Sylvia Plath's Bell Jar. For days afterward, I couldn't stop thinking about the girl in the novel and what she went through. Uh, for some reasons, it made me restless and distracted. One morning in class, with Plath on my mind, I suddenly decided that I needed to get up, leave school, and walk home. Home was three or four miles away. As I walked along, I began to notice that the colors and shapes of everything around me were becoming very intense. And at some point, I began to realize that the houses I was passing were sending a message to me. Look closely, you are special, you are especially bad. Look closely and you shall find. There are many things you must see, see, see. I didn't hear these words as literal sounds as though the houses were talking and I were hearing them. Instead, the words just came into my head. They were ideas I was having. Yet I instinctively knew they were not my ideas. They belonged to the houses and the houses that put them in my head. By the time I walked through my parents' front door, one, maybe two hours later, I was tired, hot, and very frightened. 
ending the passage. I then became seriously ill as a Marshall Scholar studying ancient philosophy at Oxford University. At first, it seemed like I had a depression with mild psychotic features, which is often, as I understand, how schizophrenia begins. But then my illness evolved into a pure thought disorder. Despite much resistance, I eventually found my way to a psychiatric hospital with strong encouragement from my doctors at the university whom I had seen at the urging of a friend who himself is a neurologist. I had graduated as class valedictorian at Vanderbilt University and accepted it as a Marshall Scholar at Oxford, but I was in terrible shape. I spent much of my time wandering the streets of Oxford, gesticulating incoherently, mumbling to myself and contemplating various ways to commit suicide, to rid the world of my evil. I had absolutely no insight into the severity of my condition. I had no awareness that there might be a gap between how I saw myself and how others saw me. I entered the hospital voluntarily, not understanding that far from needing to make peace with my mental illness, I had no idea that I had a mental illness to make peace with. After there, everything changed. It wasn't something a doctor or a friend or a fellow patient said. It was a simple look into a mirror, reading from the text. It was the first time I'd actually seen myself in weeks, and it felt as if someone had punched me in the stomach. Good God, I thought, who is that? I was emaciated and hunched over like someone three or even four times my age. My face was gaunt. My eyes were simultaneously vacant and full of terror. My hair was wild and filthy, my clothes wrinkled and stained. It was a visage of a crazy person on the long forgotten back ward of a hospital for lunatics. Ending the passage. The gap between who I imagined myself to be and whom I saw in the mirror that day was profound and unavoidable. That moment, that look in the mirror was the beginning of a journey that would last over four decades. In retrospect, it's no accident <clears throat> that the song I chose to listen to most often, actually over and over, on the psych ward after that experience was the Beatles. Once there was a way to get back homeward, once there was a way to get back home, I needed to find my way home. And I think Freud was a brilliant thinker and he got many things right. What I don't think Freud got right is his view that intense talk therapy is not helpful to people who are psychotic. According to Freud, analysis was not appropriate for psychotic patients because an individual who was actively psychotic could not form a transference to the analyst. Freud's view is absolutely not consistent with my experience. In my experience, the need to be in a relationship, to be part of a social world, may be most profound precisely when someone is psychotic. Please let me say this point again. When a person is psychotic is when the person may be feeling most scared and alone. That's when a relationship can be most important. For those of you who work with people like me, who have lived experience of a psychotic illness, please be aware that there is almost always a method to our madness. I began my first work with a psychoanalyst at Oxford, and it was difficult and painful work. What I noticed from my first experience with intensive talk therapy is two things. First, my analyst was hugely helpful in diffusing a sense of shame that went along with the thoughts I was having. My thoughts were violent and deeply disturbing about myself and other people. My analyst, who I'll call Mrs. Jones, was able to tolerate everything. It's difficult for me adequately to convey how helpful it was to me to have a therapist who could listen, not judge me, uh, and not threaten to me to put, to put me in the hospital or call the police. I felt safe with her. Second, I noticed that as I felt more related to my analyst, Mrs. Jones, I began to make friends and I found it easier to work again. As I became able to share my internal experience my ability to interact with the world around me got better. 
I want to note and emphasize that the most helpful consultant I had in England said two things. First, I needed to be in an intensive psychotherapy. And second, I should be back in school as a way to exercise my mind. I will be forever grateful to that consultant who stood alone amidst others recommending I leave school and return home to the States. He was exactly right. I like to say that my mind has been my best friend and my worst enemy. That consultant understood that nurturing my mind offered me a path forward in my life. Most important, the consultant's words came in the form of an offer and not a mandate. I finished my degree at Oxford and I came back to the States to study law at Yale. My transition was rocky. For someone not familiar with a psychotic illness, it's difficult to understand that at this point, I still didn't really believe I had a mental illness. My thought was that I was somehow different from other people and not in a good way, but that through the exercise of willpower, I could tame whatever was wrong. Quite literally, like one has a wild horse in a corral that you must tame. The challenges I framed it in that point in my life was to take that woman who I had seen in the mirror at Oxford <clears throat> and tame her and groom her, or maybe just make sure she always stayed at home when I went out. I was not mentally ill, I was socially maladroit. So I began Yale Law School. I was not in treatment, nor was I on medication. As a side note, my Oxford analyst had never suggested I consider meds, and it's inconceivable that she would have attempted to force medication on me. Within several weeks after law school began, I became overwhelmed. One night in the library of the Yale Law School, I became quite psychotic. And the following day, I ended up being taken to the hospital by one of my professors whose assignment had sent me over the edge. At the hospital, I found myself in a small private room waiting for a doctor. The attendant was kind and I ready, readily gave him a telephone wire bill, which I had proudly made the evening before when I'd been florally psychotic on the roof of Yale Law School and not satisfied with my jeans and bland t-shirt, decided to accessorize. I had also picked up a nail that I found and kept the nail in my pocket. Many people who are psychotic carry things which can be used as weapons, not because they wanna hurt someone, but because they're afraid someone may want to hurt them. This point is hugely important. A show of force, perhaps by the police, may be terrifying to someone who's psychotic and initiate a dangerous, potentially lethal sequence of events because of how differently the people involved perceive what is happening. Uh, ending the passage. This visit to the emergency resulted in a lengthy five-month hospitalization reading from the text. But you can't have my six inch nail, I said, patting my pocket. Then someone whom I'll call just the doctor arrived. Give that to me, he ordered. No, I said. The doctor immediately called for security. Another attendant came in, this one not so nice. Once he pried the nail from my fingers, I knew I was done for. Within seconds, the doctor and his whole team of goons swooped down, grabbed me, lifted me out of the chair and slammed me down on a nearby bed with such force that I saw stars. Then they bound both my legs and arms to the metal bed with thick leather straps and they put a net over my body. A sound came out of my mouth that I never heard before. Half groan, half scream, barely human and pure terror. Then the sound came again, forced from somewhere deep inside my belly and scraping my throat raw. No, I shouted, stop this, don't do this to me. I glanced up to see a face watching the entire scene through the window in the steel door. Why was she watching me? Who was she? I was an exhibit, a specimen, a bug impaled on a pin and helpless to escape. Please, I begged, please. This is like something from the Middle Ages. Please don't do this to me. Ending the passage. Shame is a pervasive experience of people with psychosis. Often, we're ashamed of what we're thinking, and so we hide our thoughts from other people. This shame may play itself out in many ways. After my experience in the emergency room, five months of hospitalization ensued. Hospitalization involving long-term restraints and seclusion. So the first couple of days, 
I was restrained uh, for about 20 hours a day. And then the next three weeks restrained anywhere between five, five and 15 hours a day. And my chart had this notation, use restraints liberally. By the way, uh, when I lived in England, they hadn't used restraints for over 100 years. After my experience in the emergency room, uh, five months of hospitalization, so yeah, okay, I talk, talked about that, and no forcible medication and no privacy. In the beginning, I was even watched as I showered and went to the bathroom, and I was not allowed privacy while talking to people, including my parents. Staff had to be there. I believe that the hands-off approach, perhaps it could be described as benign neglect <clears throat> that I experienced at the hospital was preferable to the over-interventionist approach, <clears throat> often driven by risk management concerns of the American hospitals. I do believe that force may have an appropriate limited role on psychiatric treatment, but force should not be confused with treatment. Reflecting on my experiences in American psychiatric hospitals, I do not believe that the use of force helped me move forward toward healing, toward accepting that I had a mental illness, or toward agreeing to take medication. In fact, I think the use of force had precisely the opposite effect for me. As I've come to say, I'm very pro-psychiatry, but very anti-force. <clears throat> After two weeks on an emergency commitment, I was faced with the question of whether I would try to get out of the hospital. Parenthetically, the doctors put me on an emergency commitment because they said I was, quote, dangerous to myself and others, and because they said I was, quote, gravely disabled. The reason they gave for me being gravely disabled was I couldn't do my Yale Law School homework. And I wondered what that would mean about much of the rest of New Haven. I could contest their motion to civilly commit me. To me, the choice seemed clear. I would demand a hearing to fight the commitment. I brought this up to my father, who is also an attorney. My father was equally clear. Do not contest this because if you lose, you now have been civilly committed and you're going to have to report your commitment every time you apply for a license to practice law. He said to me, you certainly don't want anything in your record or a judge or orders you to stay in the hospital. When I speak about the political dimensions of schizophrenia, I speak not only about the social stigma, which is real and pervasive, I also speak about those life events that can follow an individual with schizophrenia for decades. There are profound political aspects to this illness that can become huge burdens that people with schizophrenia carry. I'm obviously teaching to the proverbial chorus uh, on this point today, but I'm very glad my father saw that uh, was there to counsel me at that moment. The stigma of mental illness can follow a person for a lifetime. And I have found that stigma can be pervasive. When I returned to law school, I decided to write an article for the law journal on the use of mechanical restraints in psychiatric hospitals. I approached a law school faculty member who was also a psychiatrist and analyst and explained my project to him without giving any of my personal history. I said that I imagined mechanical restraints would be painful and degrading. His response to me was, quote, you don't understand, Ellen. These people are psychotic. They aren't like you and me. They wouldn't experience restraints in the way we would. I didn't have the courage in that moment to tell him, these people are just like you and me, and that's exactly how they would experience restraints. So by othering people, we allow ourselves to do things to them that we wouldn't want done to ourselves or families. I'll share one more brief anecdote about stigma. I went to the ER with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a bleed in my brain, um, which I think like kills 50% of people within a couple of days. I'm glad I didn't know I would have had a heart attack. Um, anyway, I was confused and incoherent. The ER folks learned about my psychiatric history and then a predictable disaster occurred. They believed I was simply having a psychotic episode and they sent me home. I went back the next day at the frantic urging of friends who this time accompanied me to the ER. They were able to convince the doctors that something was very different from what they'd seen in the past. The ER ran some simple tests, uh, spinal tap, eventually angiograms, and they admitted me to the hospital. 
I was very lucky to have those close friends with me. Otherwise, I imagine I would have once again been told to take more of my medication and then sent home. Stigma can be deadly. So we've discussed uh, personal identity aspects of the illness. We've talked some about the social aspects and we've touched upon the political aspects. I wanna push these ideas further by talking about the centrality of relationship to healing. Healing does not occur in isolation. It's painful to me when I speak with mental health professionals working in community mental health centers who measure their caseload in the hundreds. A close friend of mine, a conscientious and kind psychiatrist working in an LA clinic had around 350 patients. How in the world do you do that? Healing begins in relationships and in all kinds of ways. A patient's relationship with a mental health professional is an integral part of the hearing. I worry tremendously that this point has been lost on our policymakers. Of course, other relationships are healing as well. After I was hospitalized upon returning to the US, I took the rest of that year off, what would have been my first year at law school, and then I re returned the following fall to begin again. It was when I began Yale Law School a second time that I made my closest friend and a man named Steve Benke. Steve is an attorney and a clinical psychologist uh, with an appointment in clinical ethics in Harvard's Department of Psych Psychiatry, reading from the text. One of the worst aspects of schizophrenia is the profound isolation, the constant awareness that you're different, some sort of alien, not feel fully human. Uh, other people have flesh and bones and insides made of organs and healthy living tissue. You are only a machine with insides made of metal. Medication and talk therapy allay this terrible feeling. A con friendship can be as powerful as either. Quoting from the text. Steve and I were in contracts class together and a couple of times he'd asked me for an assignment. Other than that, we'd never really spoken. One evening at dinner in the law school dining hall, the conversation was casual and pleasant, drifting from one subject to another classes and law journal and summer jobs. I noticed that Steve seemed engaged enough. He nodded, he smiled, but after a while, it began to look like simple politeness. As our classmates got up to leave the table, I realized I wasn't ready to go just yet. And there began one of those conversations that lasts for a lifetime, one in which there's immediate comfort and acceptance, the equivalent of someone's strong hand offered to you when you most need to grasp it. That first talk flew far and wide, how we got to Yale, who our families were, and then philosophy and religion, and what mattered to us and why. Steve had majored in classes at Princeton, where he was named salutatorian of his class, and spoke in Latin at graduation. The summer after graduation, he worked as a janitor at a small town airport, and he'd then gone to Rome, where he lived with a group of Benedictine monks and read Latin at the Vatican, with a monk who served as the Pope's Latinist. He considered entering the monastery and studying medieval philosophy, but decided against it because medieval philosophy had ceased to hold his interest, at least as a lifelong endeavor. Instead of becoming a monk, Steve came to Yale Law School, and so did I, and neither of one of us was quite sure why. Sometime later, it occurred to me that at the very moment I was being tied to a bed in a psych ward, screaming bloody murder and afraid for my life, Steve was singing Gregorian chant in a monastery overlooking the ancient city of Rome. And here we were now, come to the same place from two very different directions. It was past midnight when we said goodnight, and as I walked back to my room, I had the distinct feeling in the middle of my usual muddle that I'd been unexpectedly blessed. I don't know why I decided to tell Steve the truth about myself. I don't know why I thought I could tr trust him, but I did. I believe from our very first conversation that this man would be a significant friend and a force for good in my life. Once the possibility came to my mind, I realized how much I wanted it to be so. But I didn't believe it could happen unless I revealed the truth about myself and let him see me in full. So much of what I did on a daily basis was about faking it. I knew that I would never fake it with him. And so on a rainy afternoon at a pizzeria in New Haven, 
I shared my history. Aside from doctors and therapists, it was the first time I'd ever done this with anyone, anywhere. Without Steve's support, I could not have made it so successfully through school, if indeed I could have made it at all. Steve was a second set of eyes who could see me slipping uh, when, I, uh, when I couldn't. He was a rock who could support me when I was about to fall. And he was a true friend who helped me find meaning and pleasure in my life when meaning and pleasure felt like distant memories. After Steve had graduated from law school and left New Haven, my then analyst, who I'll call Dr. Wright, announced that he was gonna close his practice in three months, fully two years before I had planned to leave. The new news of White's leaving shattered me. Again, I returned to what I see as Freud's mistaken view that psychotic patients don't form transferences with their analysts. In fact, my transferences were quite powerful and the end of my first two analytic relationships could easily have landed me in the hospital. And in fact, I think one of them was a contributing factor to my hospitalization in New Haven. When White gave me the news of his planned early retirement, Steve was traveling around the country interviewing for PhD programs in clinical psychology. He had sensed that something was terribly wrong and he came to New Haven to see me. Quoting from the text, I opened the door of my studio apartment. Uh, Steve would later tell me that for all the times he'd seen me psychotic, what he saw that day shocked him. For a week or more, I had barely eaten. I was gaunt and moved as though my legs were wooden. My face looked and felt like a mask. Since I pulled down all the shades, the apartment in the middle of the afternoon was a near total darkness. The air was fetid, the place was a shambles. Steve has worked with many patients who suffer from severe mental illness. To this day, he'll tell me that on that afternoon, that looked as bad, I looked as bad as any he'd ever seen. Hi, I said, then returned to the couch where I was silent for several minutes. Thank you for coming, Steve, I finally said. Crumbling world, word, voice, tell the clocks to top. Time is, time has come. Uh, White is leaving, Steve said somberly. I'm being pushed into a grave. The situation is grave, I moaned. Gravity is pulling me down. Tell them to get away. I'm scared, ending the passage. Healing takes place in many forms and in many venues. I could not have survived this illness without close friends, family, and colleagues who have known me over the course of my illness and have been there to help me. Healing takes place in relationship. At this point, I want to mention a project of the Sachs Institute that has supported decision-making. Our research focuses on supporting individuals with lived experience as they make treatment decisions. The goal of our research is to explore whom individuals choose to make these important decisions. Um, so we're gonna uh, ask people to pick supporters and we're gonna ask them um, uh, whether they were happy with the supporters they picked and downstream effects on quality of life by having supported decision-making like less institutionalization in hospitals or jails. Um, so uh, we believe that supported decision-making will enhance an individual's ability to exercise their autonomy by including trusted friends in the decision-making process. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, please let me say as plainly as I can, our approaches and our policies must be based on the centrality of relationship to healing. Perhaps that sounds soft-headed, but relationships are what saved my life. I believe relationships are where healing begins. We ignore the centrality of relationships uh, at our own peril. As wonderful as Steve was and is, he was a friend, like a brother. Around the time I received tenure, shortly after, I ran into a man named Will, a man I thought was handsome, friendly, and smart. A man with whom I tried to flirt a few times when I was working toward tenure, and he was working in a law library at USC. Um, uh, I, you know, I would tell him I need to fax him something. Can you help me? Um, and he never really picked up that I wanted to uh, get together with him. I, I basically dated normally in high school and college, but when I became ill and I developed my mental illness, uh, I stopped dating for really about 18 years because I was too tormented by internal demons to have uh, room for, in my life for that. Um, but, uh, you know, at this point, I mustered my courage and asked if uh, Will would like to have lunch sometime. 
coming to the reading from the text. When it came to my personal life after my illness had quieted down somewhat, I started nurturing a fragile but growing hope for a relationship with a man named Will, a librarian at USC and an artist. Uh, as I said, I tried flirting with him to no avail. Who knew who had to do that? But after he left USC, he invited me to lunch. And then he invited me to see the California Poppy Reserve in Lancaster, not far from Los Angeles. I actually kept hinting how cold I was, uh, hoping he would put his arm around me, but he didn't. And that left me feeling very deflated. But at the end of the day, when he brought me home, and he kissed me good night after that first date, a long lingering kiss. I thought to myself, huh, this is even better than getting an article accepted. <laughs> the next day, Will brought me a feather from his parrot, which he pasted on my computer. That night, I asked my Vanderbilt friend, Kenny, whether he thought that a guy plucking a feather from his bird to paste it on your computer meant he liked you. To which Kenny responded without a beat, I don't know, Ellen. But one thing for sure, he likes you better than he likes his parrot. <laughs> I wanted a relationship with Will and slowly I began to believe that it actually might happen. Eventually I told Will that I loved him and indeed he was the first man I had ever loved in that way. He said that made him very sad. At the right moment, I told him about my illness and he responded as gently and kindly as a person could. If C's friendship had made me feel human, Will was making me feel like a woman. Ending the passage. When I say my relationship with Steve made me feel human, please don't take care, take that metaphorically. I didn't think it was a metaphor. I did not feel like a human. I felt my insides were made of metal and that things that happened to other people, the feeling that other people had, weren't part of my life. I believed I was something else, a machine. Please understand how shaming this experience would be for one of your clients to tell you especially a young person who is just getting to know his or her mind. It was those two relationships with Steve and with Will, which brought me not simply to think, but to feel that I am human and I am capable of loving relationships. Today, Steve and Will are my closest friends, and I think of them as my two pillars. But there was a point where I thought I may have lost Steve. I suffered from an episode of Capra syndrome, in which you believe a person who's been taken over, you believe a person has been taken over by someone or something else. That person is no longer really that person, akin to the film of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, if anyone has happened to see that. The Capcourse episode happened to me in the mid 90s when I was in intense struggle with my analyst, who I'll call Dr. Kaplan, about how much medication I should be on. As was often the case in my treatments, struggles about real world practical issues, such as how many pills I would take had delusional counterpoints. The struggle over medication, which many psychiatric patients experience and other struggles with Dr. Kaplan, left me, feeling violent, left me with violent fantasies about what I wanted to do to him. And I experienced vivid fantasies about ways I could hurt him. These thoughts got talked about in the therapy. Talking about my violent thoughts helped diffuse them. Uh, but in this case, the struggle was intense enough that my delusional thinking had overwhelmed me. Dr. Kaplan and I had reached a compromise about how much meds I would take, which I was not happy with, but with which I agreed. The Kafka symptoms dissipated, but they left me and Will and Steve shaken. The only way to understand why the Capris episode was so disturbing to me is to understand that the relationship with Steve and Will were a tether to my own humanness. If I lost these ties to my humanness, I might really no longer be human. I did not feel like I was speaking in metaphor here. I really didn't believe I was human. Please let me empathize, emphasize that I'm not an autonomy purist. Indeed, I'm considered on the conservative side by certain activists because I do believe there are appropriate times for coerced interventions. My belief based on my personal experience is that coercion always comes with a price. In certain instances, we may be willing to pay the price of coercion, but we should never ignore the price that we pay. So I've been talking here about myself and relationship, and I would like to return to say a few more words about my relationship with my illness and how I conceptualize that relationship. 
in important respects, understanding my relationship with my mental illness has been the key to my illness and my health. When I moved to Los Angeles from New Haven, my analyst and I developed a way of talking, a sort of heuristic, about my illness and my relationship to illness. There were, in our manner of speaking, three me's. There was Ellen, there was Professor Sachs, and there was a lady at the medical charts. I wanna be clear that we're not talking about these as different personalities, but rather as different aspects of myself that I experienced differently. I could not integrate these three aspects of myself. How could I be a thinker of big thoughts, an academic, if my mind were so damaged? How could I be both Professor Sachs and the lady of the medical charts? And where did Ellen fit in all of this? What took a huge amount of effort and what was ultimately self-defeating was keep, to keep them separate. I wasn't sure who was the real me. This confusion expressed itself in an intense ambivalence to our taking my medication. For many years, my motto was the less medicine, the less effective. I believed if I could get by without medication, then I really didn't have a mental illness. Steve was a virtual saint as he spent literally years of our relationship with me going through time and time when I tried to get off my meds with disastrous results. It wasn't simply I didn't like the side effects of my psychiatric medication. The need to take medication reached the core of my identity. If I could get by without medication, I wasn't really mentally ill and the lady at the charts would disappear. Only Ellen and the professor would be left as the real me. This cycle culminated in one final effort to get off my medication several years after I'd been on the faculty at USC, reading from the text. While White had supported me many times in my efforts to get off medication, which I undertook with great gusto and failed miserably at each time, one uh, battle between Kaplan and me incurred the use of and concerned the use of medication. Early on, we really locked horns over this. Kaplan thought I should just stay on the meds and get on with my life. For me, as I've said, the motto was the less medicine, the less effective. Part of the way we could prove I wasn't mentally ill, which I resisted mightily for many years, was to get off medication. And so I kept trying and trying and trying. I decided to make one last effort to get off. I thought I had never really tried hard enough and I put lots of extra supports in place to help me keep myself true to my goals. And so I started the reduction. I hid what I was feeling when I started feeling bad. The days and nights were harder now. The sheer physical effort of containing my body and my thoughts felt like trying to hold back a team of wild horses. Sleep was spotty and filled with dreams that left me awake and sweating in terror. Nevertheless, I dropped down to dose again. Months before, I accepted an invitation to present at a workshop at Oxford. By the time I boarded the plane for home, I was a complete wreck. When I walked into Kaplan's office my first day back, I headed straight for the corner crouched down on the floor and began to shake. All around me were thoughts of evil beings poised with daggers. They'd slice me up in thin slices or make me swallow hot coals. Kaplan would later describe me as, quote, writhing in agony. Even in this state, what he accurately described as acutely and floridly psychotic, I refuse to take more meds. The mission is not yet complete. Immediately after the appointment with Kaplan, I went to see Dr. Martyr, that is his real name, a schizophrenia expert who was following me for part of dyskinesia. He'd never seen me ill before and had been under the impression, and I hadn't disabused him of it, that I had a mild psychotic illness and my primary concern was avoiding or at least minimizing TD. Once in his office, I sat on his couch, folded over and began muttering. I was disheveled. I couldn't remember when I'd slept or what I'd eaten. Why not had I bathed? In Oxford, before Oxford, did it matter if we were all gonna die anyway? Anyone who walked into that room would have thought Martyr was treating a schizophrenic street person. Weeks later, people told me that's exactly what I looked like. Head explosions and people trying to kill. Was it okay if I totally trashed your office? You need to leave if you think you're gonna do that, said Martyr. Okay, small, fire on nice. Tell them not to kill me. Tell them not to kill me. What have I done wrong? All the explosions, hundreds of thousands with thoughts, interdiction. Ellen, do you think you're dangerous to self or other people or to yourself, he asked. That's a trick question, I said. 
I don't think you ask a mental health law professor whether she meets the criteria for commitment in the language of the statute. I'm not sure how you do it, but not that way. No, it's not, he said. I'm uh, serious. I think you need to be in the hospital and I could get you into UCLA right now and the whole thing could be very discreet. Ha, ha, ha. You're offering to put me in the hospital? Hospitals are bad. They're mad. They're sad. Well, I must stay away. I'm God or I used to be. I give life and I take it away. Forgive me for I know not what I do. I really think a hospital would be a good idea, Martyr said. No, thanks. Oh, so very much, I said. All right, then, but if I were you, I would stay away from work for a while. You don't want your colleagues to see this. Thanks, banks, bang, bye, see you soon. Oblivious to the look on his face, I left. The next morning, I did drag myself to my office because it was my hideout and refuge. I ran into my colleague, Ed, in the hall, and he quickly figured, figured out what was happening. Ellen, what the hell's going on? I thought you were kidding at first, but you're not, are you? Does anyone else know about this? Is it okay for anyone else to know? I wouldn't mind telling Michael, I said, not the archangel one, our colleague. Suffice to say that Ed eventually brought me home, showing the good judgment to follow my doctor's advice rather than tackle me to the ground and take me to the hospital, as other, others were recommending, uh, including uh, his internist wife. Eventually, I acceded to everyone's demands and to take more meds. I could no longer deny the truth and I could not change it. The wall that kept me, Ellen, Professor Sachs, separate from the insane woman I had once seen in that mirror long ago, like smashing in rooms, ending the passage. And then another event pushed me past the point of no return and accepting I indeed had a mental illness. I got it on a new drug. Again, reading from the text. Because of the, let me just check some. Okay. Because of the risk of my meds, Kaplan suggested one of the new class of antipsychotics, a drug called olanzapine. I ended up on a super high dose, like 17, 70 milligrams, and still having a lot of uh, breakthrough symptoms. And I got on clozapine, uh, which has, has been a miracle drug for me. I don't have no symptoms, but very few at this point. Uh, the change with the Zyprexa was fast and dramatic. First, the side effects were much less than with Navane. More important, the clinical result was not to overstate it, like daylight dawning after a long night. I could see the world in a way that I'd never seen it before. The illness was still there, but it wasn't pushing me around as much as it once did. Finally, I could focus on the task at hand, unencumbered by the threat of lurking demons. The most profound effect of the new drug was to convince me once and for all that I actually had a real illness. For 20 years, I struggled with that acceptance, managing to hold on to the belief that basically there was nothing unusual my, about my thoughts. Everyone's mind contained the chaos that mine did, it's just they were all better at managing it than I was. My problem, I thought, had less to do with my mind than with my lack of social graces. I was not mentally ill, I was socially maladroit. Of course, that wasn't true. There's no way to overstate what a thunderclap this revelation was to me. And with it, my final and most profound resistance to the idea that I had a mental illness began to give way. Ironically, uh, the more I accepted that I had a mental illness, the less the illness defined me. It became accident and not essence, at which point the riptide that had kept sucking me and set me free, ending the passage. I was finally able to integrate the three parts of myself. I was indeed Ellen, the professor, and the lady of the medical charts. It was by making peace with the lady of the medical charts that my mental illness, my mental illness that allowed Ellen and the professor to flourish and to enjoy the many wonderful relationships that have blessed my life. Making my peace with my mental illness was a project that took most of my life. I've been enormously gratified by how my memoir, The Center Cannot Hold, has been received. With monies from a MacArthur grant I founded at the Sachs Institute for mental health law policy and ethics at U.S. City. The goal of the Sachs Institute is to translate ideas into action to better the lives of people with mental illness. I'm very proud to say that folks with lived experience are involved in every aspect of what we do at the Institute. We are your sisters, your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your colleagues, and your friends. We want, in the words of Sigmund Freud, what everyone wants, to work and to love. As I reflect back on my life, 
I wish I had learned to work and to love earlier. I wish I hadn't had to endure all the struggles within that I could have lived a life without mandates. I don't know what could have made me smarter sooner, what could have sped up that process. I don't believe that force would have helped. In fact, for me, force would probably have had exactly the opposite effect. Thank you for listening to me today. And thank you especially for your service to our country. Please consider the Sachs Institute your friend. Thank you very much. So I think we have time for questions. Questions on the right. Sorry, say that again. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk and sharing your experience with us. Oh, you're very a, welcome. I have a couple of questions. Thinking about, you know, your your thoughts on respecting the autonomy of patients and to dispelling the stigma, especially kind of coming into the emergency department. Is there ways that you've found providers can be helpful in advocating for individuals who have serious mental illness to help dispel some of that as they go through medical complexities that are naturally bound to occur? And two, thinking about ways to kind of minimize that from kind of legal ethical perspective, was wondering if you had any thoughts on psychiatric advanced directives and how that might be helpful in that endeavor. Uh, yes, I, mean, I think that's a really important point. I. I think uh, respecting autonomy and reducing stigma are both incredibly important things and that advocating for individuals is really important too. Um, so uh, we've actually um, are doing a study uh, of instead of finding people, patients incompetent and appointing a guardian to make decisions for them, we're using a product called supported decision making. We ask people to choose uh, individuals in their lives who know them and whom they trust to be their supports. One of our studies is looking at people who choose um, their satisfaction with the decision-making process and downstream effects on quality of life, like more independent living and more independent working. Um, and the second study, uh, uh, um, we had some funding from the millionaire tax to kind of launch it. and other people are doing the heavy lifting at this point, um, looks at uh, 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 um, uh, psychiatric advance directives as well as supported decision-making. And we're looking at big counties and small counties and rural counties and urban counties and counties with heterogeneous populations and counties with homogeneous population. Um, and we're also asking people to make psychiatric advance directives which is itself a way to, to foster autonomy because people are deciding in advance what they want to happen to them. And I think, I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, you know, I was, you know, I was hospitalized um, and, you know, I wish people had, you know, asked, asked me my opinion about different things that I would want or not want, uh, but instead they just, you know, did what they wanted. Um, so, you know, um, so, uh, so it's, okay. Okay. Oh, so how can people help advocate for, for, uh, um, these folks? Um, I think, uh, I think, uh, by doing you know, doing research and writing papers, um, and also, you know, connecting people, connecting with people with lived experience, you know, uh, maybe talking to them uh, about, uh, about, you know, what, what for them would be the optimal outcome in terms of uh, support or independence, uh, that kind of thing. Um, uh, so you know we can help out. So we can help advocate, uh, you know, by by doing research and writing articles, um, and by uh, you know being part of programs that are looking at these kinds of things. You know, uh, there's a guy called Toby Ewing here in town who um, 
helps you know people set things up to like take advantage of the millionaire tax and that that kind of thing um uh and you know basically you know again ask the ask the client ask the patient uh, what they would like you to advocate for and you know be very mindful you know and you know kind of privilege that to some extent you know obviously if someone is completely incapacitated you know you know we should have you know a benign other making the choice so as an example an example i give if i say you know i would really love to be on this medica medication again because it really really helped me um but my you know a voice is telling me that if i take that it will cause a nuclear explosion so I think that person, you know, doesn't have the capacity to consent and we may need to have a proxy decision maker. You know, capacity is something I have uh, studied quite a bit. Um, so the MacArthur instruments, they're the gold standard. They look at understanding, appreciating, reasoning, and evidencing a choice. Um, I actually developed a, a, a questionnaire called uh, the California Scale of Appreciation, which looks at the question of whether the person appreciates their illness and the need for care. Uh, it's kind of interesting because like on the appreciation component uh, of the MacArthur, like 25% of people are found incompetent. And on my instrument, it's more like two to 4%. So, you know, the question of where we draw the line it's an important question. It's, an, it's a normative question, but it's also empirical. I mean, we can look and see what the outcome is of the different different policies. Um, so that's you know that's kind of uh, kind of what I think think about that. Um, but uh, you know, help you know again help people advocate um, by finding out what they really really want and uh, need and value. Of course, it's a lot easier if you have a psychiatric advance directive look to look at, because um, it will say things like, you know, where do I want to be treated if ill, inpatient, outpatient commitment, um, you know, what sorts of meds I want, what sorts of meds I don't want, you know, <clears throat> who I want to be informed about this, who I don't want to be informed about it, you know, and all those kinds of all those kinds of things they will have thought about in advance. Although it's kind of interesting because people can vote with their feet. So um, this was not a formal advanced director, but I was like eating too many cookies and stuff like that. And I said to my friends in my dorm, you know, um, you know, uh, tell me not to go and get cookies. And if I go and get them and bring them back, you know, tell me not to eat them. Um, and, uh, you know, follow me to the store, make sure I don't buy them. <laughs> So, uh, so I had that all, that was my informal advanced directive. So when they said, you know, don't do this, I said, screw you. And I walked two miles and got my cookies and brought them home. <laughs> and another example of, you know, pads, you know, or advanced directives, maybe not working as we would like them to. So I was being interviewed to be treated at a, this is not a psychiatric hospital, a regular hospital. And the woman asked me, did I have an advanced directive? Did I say this already? And uh, uh, I said I did. And she didn't ask where it was, how to find it. What did it say? She just marked on her form, I have one. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. Other questions? And I, I just wanted to thank you for your time this morning. You know, a couple sure. of colleagues messaged me during your presentation, and the consensus was that it was profoundly impactful and moving. Um, so oh, I'm really, you. really grateful to listen to you. Um, a couple you. of comments that you made at the beginning really struck me, and I was hoping you could expand a bit. You, you described um, uh, Miss Jones, who I believe was one of the right. first people who attempted to do some analytic work with you as somebody who yeah. right. was really the first person who listened to you, didn't judge, and made you feel safe. And right. shortly after, you said that something that you wanted us to take away was that there's a method to the madness with schizophrenic patients. And so my question is, 
um, as practitioners, as we're initially getting to know somebody with schizophrenia, do you have any advice, any specific advice to kind of uncode the madness for that individual or to be better listeners or to be more non-judgmental or to make our patients feel safer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really good question. You know, um, uh, some people think that, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, uh, yeah. 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 I mean, I think, I think the way you do it is by building trust. So, you know, people think sometimes that the crazy thoughts that pe- my husband says, psychosis is not an off swim switch on off switch, but a dim or at the far end, you know, just speaking about my own experience, I'll have the thought that I killed a lot of people with my thoughts and I immediately say, oh, Ellen, that's just your illness, pack, you know, acting up, pay it no mind. Further down the con- continuum, you know, say we've had house guests, you know, I, I actually love people, but I need a lot of alone time and I might have two or three days in and out of psychosis. And at the far end, I'm crouching in a corner shaking, you know, believing that demons are going to put spears through my head and so on and so forth. That hasn't happened in a good, a good 10 years. So I'm very grateful, grateful about that. Um, so, you know, uncoding the madness, I basically think, you know, psychotic thoughts kind of tell the truth about your psychic reality. So I, if I have the thought that I'm an evil, dangerous, horrible person, uh, that might, you know, just be an archaic, psychotic way uh, with the underlying thought being, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a bad person. I'm, you know, I'm not a good person, which is something pretty much everybody can say. I don't think that's like a delusion or anything like that. But I do think that the, you know, the psychotic stuff, you know, is uh, thinking about, um, you know, the psychotic stuff is... Uh, again, an archaic way, you know, um, to uh, say something, you know, true about how you feel about yourself. Um, Was there anything that worked for you to help build that trust that really helped you? So was there anything for me that helped build that trust? Um, You know, it was... uh, it was observing, you know, what my therapist and analyst reaction was to the things I was saying. I felt like they were listening, they understood, uh, they cared, um, and again, weren't threatening to, you know, put me away or call the police or call the ambulance uh, or, or call you know, someone who would make a decision that I couldn't, you know, live live independently. I thought what I said in my talk, that doctor's advice, pretty, pretty well-known doctor called Anthony Storr, you know, that I needed to be uh, in intensive therapy and that I needed uh, to continue kind of working, you know, academically um, was really very good advice. I also remember I was actually in the psych hospital and I called my dad and my parents and spoke to my dad and he, I was basically expressing a lot of um, pessimistic, you know, thoughts about the rest of my life. And he's like, Ellen, you know, you have a mental illness. There are people with terminal cancer um, who, who do well this is something you can do. My first thought was, you know, he just did not understand how awful this all was. And my second thought was, huh, you know, maybe he's right. You know, maybe I should really make an effort to, you know, get, get back into the, you know, into the right place. Actually, my, one of my brothers said that uh, I was the person, uh, the most stubborn person he knew. And that was like, 
that had you know a good side and a bad side. The good side is that I stubbornly persisted in doing my schoolwork. Um, and the bad side was that I stubbornly kept trying to get off meds for many years. So it can be a, there can be an upside and a downside to that. Thank you for answering those questions, ma'am. Uh, unfortunately, that would be the last question as we're out of time, but we appreciate okay. you taking the time to talk to us. Thank you very much for being interested in listening. Um, you know, fight on, as we say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, bye bye. Okay, just press dismiss. Nope. Okay.